Ladies and gentlemen, we'll call this hearing to order. We expect the arrival of some other senators soon when, uh, when their uh, conferences, uh, lunches break up. But we welcome you all. Today, the Foreign Relations Committee has convened to discuss the crisis in Kosovo and its potential ramifications on stability throughout the region. The committee will welcome former Congressman Joseph uh, Diogardi, who currently um, is the volunteer president of the Albanian American Civic League. I confess that I'm deeply concerned about the situation in Kosovo today. Since February of this year, approximately 150 people have been killed in a particularly appalling fashion. And the Serbian police have uh, attacked and murdered innocent women and children in their effort to crack down on the Kosovar Albanian separatist movement. The Albanian community in Kosovo has shown remarkable re reserve in their pursuit of the autonomy that was uh, revoked in 1989 and 90. But as we have all seen, that patience has worn thin. The gathering strength of the Kosovo Liberation Army in their quest for an independent Kosovo and their violent tactics to achieve their goals leads me to believe that things in Kosovo may yet get even worse. The Serbs have shown in recent months that uh, they are more than willing to use overwhelming force in response to separatist activity in Kosovo. And I do not expect that the attitude, that attitude to change. I sincerely hope that our administration does not consider President Milosevic's role in the Bosnian peace process, however great or small, as justification for leniency with regard to his abhorrent behavior in Kosovo. I realize the policy challenges facing the United States and the international community in responding to the Kosovo crisis. Secretary of State Madeleine Albright has used strong words of warning to President Milosevic, but I must say the direction of the United States policy on this issue is unfortunately unclear. Given the potential this conflict has to spread to the rest of the Balkans and beyond, even involving our NATO allies, Greece and Turkey, I think it is critical for the administration to clearly state its policy on this question. We recognize former Congressman Joseph uh, Diogardi with the Albanian American Civic League. Congressman, welcome. Nice to be here, Senator. I recall being here in this very position facing you on, I guess it was uh, February 1991, just over seven years ago when you were concerned, really concerned about what was going to happen in Yugoslavia. And I remember ending that testimony by saying that I didn't think that Yugoslavia was going to stay together. We're all hoping that it would. The United States was banking its foreign policy on it. And all we heard during that meeting was how Albanian terrorists and separatists and the quest for greater Albania was going to destroy Yugoslavia and now we see what destroyed Yugoslavia, which was there all the time, the quest for greater Serbia. Slobodan Milosevic, when he walked in to Kosovo and brutally occupied it and took away its legitimate status as one of the eight juridical units of the Confederal Republic of Yugoslavia, where Kosovo had an equal vote with Serbia, it rotated every year, created in less than a few years, not only apartheid, but a Warsaw ghetto that still exists in the heart of Europe today. I wouldn't be concerned, Senator, about greater Albania. I'd be concerned that we've already legitimized ethnic cleansing by creating a phony republic called Srpska. It never existed. It's there. Why? Because Slobodan Milosevic wanted it. The person who in the news last Sunday is targeted by his former friend Karacic in a book saying he's about to now go to Hague and he's going to turn state's evidence and he's pointing the finger at his friend Slobodan Milosevic as the architect of some of the most brutal, unbelievable atrocities since the Nazi era. We don't have to worry about greater Albania. 
we have to worry about what I was worried about back in February of 1991. And at that time, I can only wave in front of you a Serbian version of this. I'm now going to give you the English translation. This is what Slobodan Milosevic has been weaned on. Here it is, the expulsion of the Albanians, a paper presented by his mentor, a professor, former minister of the Yugoslav government, Vazul Trubilovic, in Belgrade, March 7, 1937. If you want to see what happened in Bosnia, what's happening in Kosovo today, read word for word, line by line, exactly what's going on, their MO, their modus operandi, shelling villages, burning them down, getting rid of Albanians at all costs, because this is territory they want. He will not abandon this. And as we keep waffling in this body and in the State Department, he will just go and take more and more and more and more. He bluffed his way right through Bosnia, and he got Srpska. He's bluffing his way right now. He knows that there's no real resolve with this Christmas warning. He sees and senses the waffling already. He sees strong words on the part of Madeleine Albright. Then Madeleine Albright is muffled by Sandy Berger. And then we have questions coming up in Gilman's hearing a few weeks ago about the Christmas warning and a very lukewarm response by Ambassador Gelbard. We have to meet with you in executive session, and you heard it again today. No direct response. Don't you think Slobodan Milosevic is hearing those responses? Don't you think he's ready to do more and more because he sees that the greatest superpower in the world has lost its resolve, has a foreign policy which has abandoned the principles upon which this country was formed? Our foreign policy should be based on fundamental human rights. That's one of the key determinants of foreign policy. We have today in Kosovo some of the most egregious examples of violations of those human rights. In fact, Senator Biden, during that hearing that you held, and it was a wonderful hearing, it was the first time that you got all groups together to talk about the problem, I had to fly in reports from the Council on Human Rights from Pristina and other places, litanies of horror. I don't have to do that today. You know why? All you have to do is read your own U.S. country report from the State Department. Here it is, the 1997 edition. But if you read the last five years, you can't believe the litany of horrors in here against the Albanian people of Kosovo. What are we waiting for? How many people have been killed and brutally, to brutally tortured and detained and disappeared? Every criteria they use has been violated. Why is there such a disconnect between those egregious violations and our professed adherence to human rights when it comes to foreign policy? Is there another deal in the wind? Perhaps you didn't ask the right questions to Ambassador Gelbard. Are we placating Russia for some reason? They're always there supporting their first cousins, the Serbs. That's where the Serbs came from in the 6th century AD, from the Ukraine. We know they're blood brothers, or at least blood cousins. They're always there supporting them. But what has Russia done for us in Iran, Iraq, and China, and so many other places? They don't support us. Why are we giving such deference to Russia? Why are we even considering a contact group at this point, including Russia? This is an issue that should be led by the United States of America in the NATO milieu, without Russia. This is where it belongs. That is what solved Bosnia. And the only reason today Bosnia is not like Kosovo, Mr. Chairman and Senator, is that we have troops there. Who are we kidding? When are we going to wake up? Another key element of our foreign policy that's been abandoned is that we will do everything to preserve the security of a vital area like the Balkans in Europe. And if you look at international law and how it defines where you uh, have a state of belligerency, you look at what the neighboring countries are saying about what's going on there. Every one of them is using language which is at the edge. Recently, the foreign minister of Greece said Kosovo is like a hand grenade. If it goes any further, it's going to explode. Uh, a Turkish spokesman of the for foreign policy said something similar, stated that the Kosovo crisis, if unchecked, could destabilize the Balkan region 
and therefore European security. NATO condemned the excessive use of force by the Yugoslav army in Kosovo and said that the North Atlantic Council is profoundly concerned about the deterioration of the situation there and was considering, quote, possible further means to maintaining stability in view of the risk of escalating the conflict in the region. On April 27th, a spokesman from the United States State Department said that if the contact group members did not agree to a new sanctions package, the United States would act unilaterally. The United States reiterated the UN and the contact group's call for the immediate withdrawal of the special police units, which are nothing more than the Yugoslav army from Kosovo, and the need for unconditional dialogue. And yet, when the contract group met in Rome on April 29th, the United States capitulated to a weak proposal for more sanctions under pressure, especially from Russia, which, as I said before, has gone out of its way not to support us in dealing with Iran, Iraq, China, and many other areas. It is obvious that the sanctions are not really an issue to Belgrade, which has already survived six years of very tough economic sanctions. In the meantime, how many Kosovar Albanians have to be killed? We talk about negotiations. We talk about so many things. No conditions. But when do we get to the point where we say, hey, thousands of Albanians are being killed. Are these negotiations working? Should we now learn from the experience we had in Bosnia that Slobodan Milosevic only understands one thing, and that's the use of force or the threat thereof. In the meantime, these sanctions will only serve to bolster nationalistic fervor on Mr. Milosevic's behalf. Only resolve will work, Mr. Chairman, and that will have to come from the only superpower left in the world, the United States of America, taking the lead with our NATO allies. In conclusion, the two million ethnic Albanians of Kosovo, who comprise more than 90% of the population there, have no human, economic, or political rights of any kind. Slobodan Milosevic has illegally and brutally occupied Kosovo now for almost 10 years. When you look at Kosovo, it's not a new story. Kosovo was part of Albania until 1916 and 17, as was that population of Albanians in Macedonia and southeastern Montenegro. That's why they're all contiguous. The line was, if you drew the line around 7 million Albanians today, you have the former state of Albania that came out of Turkish occupation. They're not looking to change those borders. The only one looking to change borders is Slobodan Milosevic. What they want is some peace in their lives, some self-determination, some ability to raise their families, to be who they want to be, and to save their national identity. And what we see right now is ethnic cleansing all over again in Kosovo that we saw in Bosnia. It's time for our State Department to understand that loose talk that brands the victims as terrorists for defending themselves, their families, their property, and I'll even add their sacred honor. It's important to Albanians the way it was important to our founding fathers, Mr. Chairman and Senator. This only serves to give the green light to the real terrorist, Slobodan Milosevic and his henchmen, who are massacring innocent people as we sit here speaking. It is time for the United States to stand up for its own principles and demand compliance with international human rights conventions before more Albanians are needlessly slaughtered and a new Balkan war is triggered, this time involving neighboring Albania, Greece, Macedonia, Bulgaria, and Turkey. It is time for Congress to stand up and voice this outrage at a foreign policy in the Balkans that has obviously failed to preserve peace and security in this vital region of the world. It is time for the United States to back up its tough words with concrete actions, such as declaring a no-fly zone in Kosovo, as we did in Bosnia. What is wrong with that? They're using these heavily armed helicopters right now to level villages. Two, ringing Serbia's border with NATO troops and moving an aircraft carrier off the coast of Montenegro. These actions would not only reaffirm our resolve to stop the escalation of the conflict in Kosovo, but I believe would lead to a lasting peace for the Albanian people and all ethnic groups in the Balkans. And when we talk about the Albanian people as fundamentalists and terrorists, let's not forget what my good friend Ben Gilman did a 
a couple of years ago at the Holocaust Museum in memorializing the Albanian people, the state of Albania, as the only nation in Europe that didn't give one Jew to the Nazis. That's now part of the Yad Vashem in uh, Israel and our museum here. And this book was written by an American Jew to memorialize that fact. And I want to leave you the letter that Ben Gilman sent to uh, members of this body in the House to say that. It's a shame that we cannot do something to save these people. These terrorist groups that come from Belgrade, special police that are really criminals let out of jail, and they're given police uniforms and army uniforms, running into homes. They know that the Albanian people save their money usually with gold. They're going there to get bounty, to get currency. They kill the families on the spot in Drenica. How many women and children were killed in their living rooms and bedrooms? We're still not allowed to go there. There is a mass grave someplace. We have testimony from the woman. They heard their men and their husbands and, and young sons screaming. They were taken away 200. There's a mass grave there someplace. We'll find it sooner or later, as we did in Bosnia. But what are we waiting for? Is this the United States that we want to represent? A country that stands on the side as a brutal dictator with state-inspired terrorism, brutalizes a group of two million people who are defenseless today in Kosovo. And what's wrong with a national liberation movement, Senator? when there's no one there to defend you. What's wrong with that? What are they gonna wait for? This is not an easy issue. It wasn't easy in 1991. It's not easy today. But let's not brand the victims as the terrorists. Let's not talk about greater Albania because that's not on the table. What's on the table constantly for 50 years, certainly in the last 10, is the quest for greater Serbia. And we seem very willing to give Mr. Milosevic what he wants. I hope we're not going to do the same in Kosovo as we did in Bosnia. It would be a tragedy of the highest proportions, and I think it would only lead to a very destabilized Balkans and a greater war later on. Thank you. The Congressman has uh, laid out some specific proposals that we declare a no-fly zone, ring the area with NATO troops, uh, and park a aircraft carrier off the coast. And this is to you, Congressman. Is, in terms of where you think, if, 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 if you have to pick a horse here, do you suggest that we, the United States, use all our influence and whatever force we're willing to use to deal with and promote and support uh, the Democratic League of, League of Kosovo or the Kosovo Liberation Army? Because right now, they're not, they ain't in tandem. Why don't we make the question a lot more simple? Why don't we look at international law, look at a population of two million people that is being brutalized every day? Because you just it's raised, useful to look at reality. Well, but reality is also, Senator, that you, you raise the issue of, well, uh, who is this George Washington that we want to find in, in Belgrade so we can solve the problem? Uh, we may have to wait a long time. But in the meantime, I agree. we cannot let these people be brutalized and killed every day. I think there are things we have to do right now. And we have are. to face Slobodan Milosevic in the eye, as we did in Bosnia, and say, get every one of those VJ troops out of Kosovo. And if you don't do it, we're going to take some action. Now, what action? We're going to bomb, action? right? What, what are we doing? Use physical force. Oh, yeah, but wait a minute. We, you, I'm not saying yes, we should. No, I want to know what you just said before, about. the arguments you made before, the same arguments that I heard was I was on a, a panel with Bob Torricelli and Senator McCain back in 1992 or three or four in the McLaughlin show, and they were saying the same thing. But we did something, didn't we? We waited three years. Sooner or later, we got the resolve, uh, you know, motif, and we said something has to be done. No, no. Why is this any different? It's not different. I just want to know what you suggest, because back then, when I was in your position, I was suggesting we bomb Belgrade. I was suggesting that we send American pilots in and blow up all the bridges on the Drina. I was suggesting we take out his oil supplies. I was suggesting very specific action. And isn't it interesting that we didn't have to go that far to begin the solution in Bosnia? Isn't it interesting that about uh, 200,000 people were killed in the meantime by the time they did Yes. It? 
And that's going to happen in Kosovo. That's why I want to know what you're suggesting now. What we have to do right now is to enforce international law. We have war criminals in Belgrade. We're dealing with one right now. I said that article before. I have a copy of it right here. Here it is. It was in the Gannett papers on Sunday. There's Slobodan Milosevic, side by side, Mr. Karadzic, who's now got a book coming out, pointing the finger at him for all these atrocities in Bosnia. Why aren't we picking him up? Because the French, the, he's in the French quarter hey. and the French let him walk around, that's why. It seems to me that we've got a, um, uh, a double standard here. If, if we're going to be the great United States of America, standing up for oppressed people, and I believe we can do that without sending military all over the world, Let's pick up the war criminals in Belgrade. We know who they are. We know where they are. And number two, let's tell Mr. Milosevic get every troop out of there. You know why? It's not because we want him to, because we like it. He is now on the brink of creating a Balkan war. You know the problems we have between Greece and Turkey. You know how fragile Macedonia is. You know that we right now have 600 troops on the border in Macedonia. What are we waiting for? If he keeps doing this, all he's doing is raising the temperature, and as the Greek foreign minister said, the hand grenade will explode and the Balkans will explode. Well, we have no choice. Let's send, do something now, then, then have to do 20 times more later on. I, 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 I agree with you. I will so there is something chairman. we can do now. I think there is. There's a number of things we can do. I think some of the things suggested here today are totally unrealistic, what we're likely to be able to do. But I think there are a number of things we can do. Uh, starting from w with the Christmas warning. I also think that you've also helped make the case. You say, let's get NATO in. What do you think is going to happen in that little vote to put NATO troops in Albania when Greece and Turkey vote? What do you think, huh? What do you, I, I want to be there at that meeting when you guys and your diplomatic skills bring the Greeks and the Turks together on a uniform vote. And, you know, we do have this little thing, you know, guys, in in, in, in uh, this little outfit called NATO called consensus. You know, you don't get them all, you don't get any of them. You know? I mean, that's kind of the NATO thing. But uh, Senator, what happened then at the last minute when we decided to do something to solve the situation in Bosnia? Because, Didn't we learn from that yeah, experience? Why can't we repeat that? Because much less of an interest that they each have there than there is inside, quote, Serbia. The purpose of calling this hearing was um, simply to uh, focus the debate and uh, get some minds to working. Uh, part of the role of the U.S. Senate is, uh, is advising, not just consenting. And uh, hopefully we have the attention uh, of, of our government and we can uh, stimulate some resolve. So we thank you all for participating. And uh, with that, we are adjourned. Let's take a quick look at that. That's today's.